Greetings Church, it's Kevin DeClaren. I'm at the corner of uh, 6th and Yam Hill, and this time I am not in front of the Pioneer Square building. We have two other individuals, yeah, it's, it's completely set up. Um, they're opposing this ministry, or this preaching, this sermon right here. This is the sermon that they're opposing. It's a preacher's salary, $46,740, the average salary for the American preacher. Um, Declare on salary, what, what every, what, whatever you put in the basket, this basket right here. And um, the passage that I'm coming from is 2 Timothy 2, 17 through 18. And then this is just a history of the work that I've done in, the, in, in, in Portland and in Seattle. Uh, this is what MacArthur and Franklin are opposing. Um, and I'm going to show you over there. They've got, um, let me put this down. Um, I came out today. Normally they don't do this, but they've got uh, they got a guitar player over there. I don't I don't know if you can see him. Uh, they got, got they got a guitar player right there. Uh, they got the blue man um, preaching on a bullhorn, and uh, on the other end of the Pioneer Square courthouse, they got an African American um, standing there begging. Uh, if you go down to Fifth Avenue, they've got two people set up at the um, at the trash can, um, and. Basically, there was one guy here, but he left. So they're opposing the message before it comes. Um, I just had um, a Klansman walk by giving me dirty looks. Uh, and so they're all over the place opposing. Um, they're opposing this to begin with. I didn't finish uh, printing all of the uh, all of the Word documents. And I don't know how much of the work uh, has already been sabotaged or taken out of the um, flash drive that I have. And I printed over 500 pages. So I'm not exactly sure if all 500 pages are there or what MacArthur has reported. Um, I've been trying to raise funds. Uh, basically, I've been trying to raise funds so that I can continue to do the work of the ministry um, as I see fit, as God has put it in, um, in my life and in my heart to do. But it's not easy because the opposition is real. Um, and MacArthur is still molesting me through this Haitian woman and keeping me from going into the church and becoming a legitimate leader uh, to get a preacher's salary like he he's been getting for I don't know 40 years he's been getting a preacher's a pastor salary uh, an elder salary for I, I have no idea how many years he's been getting an elder salary and probably over fifty thousand um, dollars he probably grosses but you know that's just how it is anyway um, I'm gonna go ahead and preach the sermon it's called preacher's salary and it's coming from that passage right there second Timothy 2 17 uh, through 18 the elder who rules well are to be considered worthy of double honor especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching for the scripture says you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing and the laborer is worthy of his wages um, but it's gonna take me a few minutes to get there because I have some things that I need to say and I don't think the American people really gives a hoot about uh, preachers getting salary, uh, getting paid, especially Haitian guys like me, you know. Um, they don't support anything, they don't listen, they don't pay attention, because we don't matter, you know. We don't, uh, our words mean absolutely nothing to the American people, and our words mean absolutely nothing to the American government. It's almost like God is not talking through us, or to, or, or use, God cannot talk through us, or use us to do any kind of ministry work. So I'm going to go ahead and see if I can reach somebody out here with this message. I don't think uh, anybody's really going to respond because they never do respond. You know, they have that chip on their shoulder, that pride in their heart. And um, I don't really know if, why I'm even bothering. But, you know, the, the Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean out on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. So we'll see what God does with uh, the preaching of the word in future times. You know, make a deposit today, maybe tomorrow. Uh, uh, he'll honor the books and the preaching that I've done uh, for the last, I don't know, 20 years or so. If not, that's fine too, because there's still heaven, and I'm content just to have the Holy Spirit. So there goes nothing. Um, good afternoon, Portland. My name is Kevin DeClaren, and I just want to take an opportunity to pray uh, real briefly here before um, I, I, I give you this message. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would work in the heart of every American that's out here and that you will remind them, um, Lord, that we no longer have a nation of slaves. This is no longer a nation that tolerates slavery 
based on the 13th Amendment. So the worker is worthy of his wages. Father, I pray that you will take away the pride of those who feel as if um, they can still enslave our people, the African people. And uh, I pray that you would take away that seed of hatred um, for our equality and that spirit of looking down on us as a result of not being part of their main race. This isn't a contest um, in the kingdom of God for us to do the work of the ministry and neither is it a contest in the world. You have called us to be your children and Lord I pray that you would work in the heart of the ignorant, the heart of the hard-hearted, and the heart of those who refuse to take you at your word. The poster that I'm holding is, uh, the title there is The Preacher's Salary. That's going to be the message coming from 2 Timothy 2, 17 through 18. The pictures there are sermons that I have preached since I've been here in Portland. And uh, books that I have written either in Seattle, Washington or here in Portland basically testifying that I've done the work of the ministry um, without pay. And this is predominantly for the church. Those of you who are church mothers, believers, so that God would put it on your heart to pray that I get out of this situation and that he either, either raise up a, a, a ministry around me or direct me to a ministry where um, the word could be honored with the preaching and uh, I could be given a stipend, a, a, a salary like you do. You know, you work for one every day. Uh, you work from nine to five. God has put it in his scriptures that we too, who do the ministry, should also get paid for the work that we do. After 20 years of waiting, there is no repentance in those that are dealing with me. And there is no turning uh, because they're still taking the bigotry position, the racism position, um, the separatist position, which is, I think is a clan position and not a Christian position. You know, the scripture says, friendship with the world is enmity with God. Um, yesterday I was on the internet and I saw that um, one of the uh, prominent preachers, Haddon Robinson, had passed away on the 22nd. That is on Sunday. He was 86 years old. And so I grieve with the family of the lost. Another brother in the faith after Billy Graham who has passed away. So the Lord is taking away those who have been rooted and grounded in the preaching and the teaching of his word. So that means that he has to raise up new leaders in this country to replace the last three major leaders that he has taken home. So those of you who are Christians who aren't aware, um, Brother Robinson had been taken home. As far as my own personal life, I'm still dealing with Gabriel Franklin and John MacArthur. I'm still being assaulted by them um, on a nightly basis. Why, I do not know why this issue of obedience to the Word of God is not being applied uh, by this pastor and by this uh, former guardian. I am no longer in a relationship with the Franklin family. Uh, it terminated or it took a backdrop in 85 and they've been being helped since 85 by the gay community, the LGBTQ, the liberation community. And it has been difficult because They've called me to the same standard of living, and when I've told them that I'm not going in that direction, it's jails and diseases and hits and hurts and threats and so on and so forth for my lack of yielding, submitting, and subjecting myself to their way of life. Now, the last time I preached, I believe it was on Sunday, the subject that I had preached on was the New Testament church and that is the New Testament church is a flesh healing, flesh resurrecting, flesh cleansing, spirit filled, spirit led, Christ centered community. Let me repeat it. On Sunday, when I had preached, and this was to refute um, the fact that the church has been called to, to become a flesh eating, flesh using, and flesh feeding community. 
In other words, we're called to have the same sex as the people in the world. And by God's grace, it's okay now for us to go back to living as harlots, homosexuals, fornicators, adulterers, effeminates. It's okay for us to go back and live that life that Christ had died on the cross and cleansed us from. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, such were some of you. So the rebuttal was the New Testament church is a flesh healing, healing from sicknesses and diseases, flesh re resurrecting. Lazarus had been called by Christ to come from the dead. Peter having laid on another person and breathing life back to them. Uh, actually, it was Paul. And Peter having raised darkness from the dead. Flesh cleansing. Paul in Acts 16, casting out a demon inside of a girl because she was demon possessed. Spirit filled. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit and we are filled with the Holy Spirit when we allow the fruits of the Holy Spirit to come through us. And Spirit led. We are led by the Spirit to do the work of the kingdom and of the ministry. Therefore, therefore we are a Christ-centered community. A community of Christians who center our lives on the name of Jesus, on the person of Jesus, and on the work of Jesus. Not just the work on, his, on the cross, but the work that he has done in the hearts of humanity since he has ascended in heaven through his holy church, through his holy word, through his holy spirit, to bring men to salvation. Now to bring us up to date, Today is the 25th of July, and I want to just say this, yesterday, not to introduce this, this topic here, the preacher's salary, on July 24th, I went to, uh, to search for work, of course, uh, I didn't find anything, putting out applications, giving uh, resumes, people don't look to hire preachers um, to do any kind of work in the secular realm. Because when you're when you work for the secular companies, you have to put out. I didn't know this in the 80s and the 90s, but what I've come to learn is that people in the world are out. The very thing that I preach against, I'm called to live and to submit to if I want to find a job. So that means I have to revert back to the old ways, the old sinful ways. So after looking and finding nothing, I went to the library, looking up my emails. I entered into a church site called Church Staffing, where they have a listing of uh, churches that are hiring pastors and evangelists and people doing mission work and that sort of thing. It was right there. I was able to find four local churches in a 12 mile radius, both in Oregon and in Washington, in Vancouver, um, where I could have applied for a senior pastor position. You know, I downloaded the information, reviewed it, and um, basically looked at the information that the churches gave um, as to who they were, what they wanted, what they were searching for, uh, the qualifications of a pastor. Um, I was in agreement with at least 99% of it, right, based on what I read, um, and I left 1% of anything that might be questionable, right, that might be alarming. Um, I couldn't fill out an application yesterday because I didn't complete my MDiv at the Master's Seminary, right, I didn't get the seminary degree, the theological degree that they require for men to enter into full-time clergy, right? And this is something that all the churches require. And they all need it to make sure that you're trained in the Greek, you're trained in the Hebrew, you understand the history of the church, you understand the, the, the theology that are being taught, what the churches agree on, why denominations have been established, what the different denominations are. So they make sure that you have gone through that form of training and you have those skills, the hermeneutical principles down so you can write sermons, 
preach sermons and do all the things that are called for those who are in full-time ministry. So out of curiosity, I kept looking on the internet and I looked up the preacher's average yearly salary and what it would be. You know, a, a professional American preacher, what would be his yearly salary if he was working for an established church? To my shock and to my surprise, after preaching for 20 years or so, I've been preaching since 1996 when I entered the, the Master Seminary. Uh, so this was about 22 years ago. Um, and I looked at the amount, which is the $46,740, and I thought to myself, wow, in 22 years, I have not even grossed a tenth of that amount. Not even a tenth. Um, and I was chagrined and heartbroken that this was the situation that God had put on my plate that for me to deal with. So this morning, so that was yesterday. So this morning, you know, I, 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 um, I tested the society last night and I wanted to see how low can I go to get um, some kind of financial response from the society. I had put up a sign yesterday or the day before asking for funds so that I would do ministry and I'm predominantly talking to the church uh, they're all around us. You just can't see who has the Holy Spirit and who doesn't. Uh, fundraising for ministry, right? Uh, for financial support, because it costs money to buy flash drives, to buy uh, this sort of thing, to print, and to do the work. You know, to keep up with the computer. A couple years ago, I had to raise funds um, to buy a new battery, which cost over $100. And so money is something that we unfortunately have to depend on um, to do some of the things that we're called to do. So this morning, so yesterday I went as far as asking the people, because they were suggesting for me, well, I'm going to skip that. So in any case, this morning I woke up again with the same hit coming from the two that I've been dealing with. I believe Franklin and MacArthur in the community. The hit has always been, as I've noted in past time, is sexual assault or physical assault. And I decided to pray instead of preach against what they had done, asking God why was his church devoid of the Holy Spirit? Why people would walk into the church who are sick, they would walk into the church building sick and would walk out of the church building without the sickness being removed from them, without any kind of healing. Why is it that some people are not being cleansed, pardoned, and forgiven? We go through the trouble of putting up the buildings so that both Christians and non-Christians could come and make their amends with the Lord and make their amends with God. No preacher should have to offer himself to do that for anybody for $2, $20, $200, as if he were a prostitute on any street corner at any given time, whether it be in broad daylight or at midnight. That's inappropriate that a society and a community should reduce any man of God to such an offense, to having to beg to be given his life back. Shame on the Master Seminary and shame on Grace Community Church, shame on Gabriel Franklin, Shame on the U.S. government. Shame on those people 
who have conspired together to do this, not only to me, but to other members of the clergy, just so that they can earn a salary or make their living. the Lord, why is it that there are so many charlatans camping out in the church? Why is it that we have so many charlatans camping out in the church? What do I mean? Men who have seminary degrees, but they have no Holy Spirit power. Men who are married, but they're living a false lie. Men who have been trained by the clergy. Men who have been given the right to fellowship, but yet when you walk into the church, their prayers don't even pass the ceiling. And God's glory or God's authority doesn't come from heaven to heal anybody that walks in or to cast out any diseases or demons. I ask God the question, why is it that? I lamented and cried against seven churches. This isn't right. Why is it like this? As a foreigner, I shouldn't be treated like this. This isn't right in the sight of God. It's not in accordance with the scriptures. But then I remembered Jesus' boldest statement. And the statement that Jesus made coming from Matthew chapter 16 verse 18 is this. And this is my first point. Jesus' is boldest statement. He says, I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not power over it. I've got four points. The first is Jesus' is boldest statement. The second is a worthy comparison. The third is a worthy wage, or worthy wages. And then the fourth is the unworthy master builder. Let's look at the first point. Jesus is build a statement. I will build my church. In all actuality, it's not our job. It's his. We're just a paid staff. We're just a paid workers who come alongside him to help him to do the work of building and establishing his church, his kingdom. Jesus is both a statement. I, I the Lord Jesus, I the Son of God, I the Good Shepherd who laid down his life for his sheep, I the Lion of Judah, I the Great I Am, I will. He's predetermined it, he's purposed it. I will, Jesus says, without permission. He's so determined. He says, I am going to do this without Roman Empire permission. I'm going to do this without the Jewish Council's permission. I am going to build my church. Of course, it cost him his life, right? I'm going to construct. I'm going to form. I'm going to use my disciples to build a church, something that no other leader has ever done by themselves. He came out of nowhere. Out of nowhere. No serpent or staff was in his hands to throw on the ground. No promise of ten plagues. Jesus put himself out there and says, I will. In other words, Satan could not stop him once he made the statement, even though the devil tried. He says, I will build, I will form, I will construct, I will establish my church, right? And here's, this is what I, the word my there, I think it's a personal pronoun, right? It's possessive. It's nobody else's church but his. He makes it personal. It makes, it, it almost puts fear inside of your heart, right? Who is this man that would claim who, would this, who is this man that would claim to own a body of people? To own a body of people, which is called the church. All of these people are going to belong to him once they profess faith in him. 
All of these people are going to be under his authority, like a king who owns vassals, who owns land, who owns a, 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 a community, who owns a country. Jesus, in his boldness, says, I will, not asking permission, I will build, I will form, establish my church. Forgiven children of God. Reconciled children of God. Those who possess the Holy Spirit. Not those who possess the European spirit, the American spirit, the African spirit, the Spanish spirit, the Asian spirit, the gay spirit, the clan spirit. You must possess the Holy Spirit that he promised. Without the Holy Spirit, you can camp out in any building, put the, put the name church on there, and all you're doing is playing church. Unless the Spirit is in you, and there is key evidence that the Spirit is in you manifesting itself, then you're just playing church. And the people are going in, and, 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 and it's, just, it's just a waste of time. It's just a waste of time. Waste of resources. So Jesus' boldest statement was, I will build my church. It's not our job. It's his job. And all we're doing is coming alongside him to help him build his church. We're just the paid workers. Those who are given half or maybe even a tenth of this much to do the work of his ministry. The second point is a worthy comparison. Anybody that's going to come alongside Jesus, right, a worthy comparison. I would compare church builders and church planters to construction workers, right? To do construction working, you need to have skills, right? You need to have skills. Skills in carpentry, mixing cement, right? Operating machinery. In the church, I would leave those skills to those who possess the spiritual gifts, right? In 1 Corinthians, The scripture talks about the spiritual gifts and it is these spiritual gifts that allows the church to have the skills and the abilities to do the work that God has called them to do. I think it's in 1 Corinthians 12. Also to construct a building, you have to have equipment and materials, wood, cement, water, nails, hammers, drills, all sorts of material and equipment to construct a building. In the church, it would need the same thing when you're establishing a building. But for the body, you need the Holy Scriptures. You need hymnals. You need teaching manuals. You need discipleship books. Right? You need flyers, tracts, evangelistic tracts. So you need equipment, material, to construct a building, to build a church. You need a plan, right? Floor plans, floor by floor, room by room, all the windows, all the doors, electrical sockets. When I tried doing that myself, the plans were sabotaged completely. So in constructing a building, you need skills, equipment, material, plans. Another thing that you need is workers. You cannot build a building without workers. Neither can you build a church without workers. Right? You need construction workers to build it. Masons, carpenters, electricians. Those are the people that you need to construct any building. You go to these 10 construction sites. 
that are working on new buildings right now and you ask them how many do you have working on each floor what's the total number of men you have and they will give it to you and they're all skilled laborers paid a salary unfortunately some of us are left with none some of us are like Phillips we go into the world to do the work of the ministry and we have to do it alone some of us are called by God according to Ephesians 4 11 through 12 and we're given the specific positions to fulfill in a church congregation where we work in my case I'm a Philip without workers a Philip whose plans have been sabotaged a Philip whose equipment and material have been stolen or lost and whose skills have been diminished when you go into a construction site and you're constructing a building there's also working signs warning signs you need to wear a hard hat you need to wear gloves you need to wear goggles you can't be on this property without a hard hat and so on and so forth I put up some working signs when I was in an apartment saying hey you can't sabotage the work that I'm doing or I'll put up a sign in the streets even getting permission from the government and they would rip down the signs and I'm thinking how is the work of this ministry going to be done if we can't put up signs if we can't have workers if we can't have equipment and material and our skills are being diminished how is this work how is this going to be accomplished right some don't care we don't care because you're not from our country you can't do this work of the ministry because you can't minister to our people some don't care right others go as far as putting on a full armor right the working signs are like putting on a full armor when you go to Ephesians 6 10 through 18 God says you need to pull on the armor of God the helmet of salvation right that Paul tells the church to wear they're warning signs And the purpose of the warning sign is to keep us and to protect us from the evils. The same way the warning signs are up, God tells us to put on a full armor so that we will be able to withstand firm against the schemes of the devil. So I'm comparing these warning signs that you find on construction sites to the armor of God that we're supposed to wear. When you go on a site, you're supposed to wear a certain gear goggles to cover your eyes right you're supposed to wear a, 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 a jacket so that everybody sees you whether you're in the darkness or in the light um, a hat to cover your head in case heavy stuff falls on your head gloves right the armor the spiritual armor is a reflection it's like a mirror we're working spiritually the armor is to protect us from the evils they're working in a physical place of danger anything could happen a person can lose an arm a leg a thigh and so on and so forth again when you're in a construction site and you're trying to construct a building you need you need property right usually the company that hires you to build for them have already licensed and purchased a property in this case we and the church are sent to the world to go make disciples of nations or we're sent to specific areas communities to reach out to those people the property that we're building is heaven anybody that we preach the gospel to who receives salvation automatically becomes a citizen of heaven every person that receives the Holy Spirit automatically becomes a citizen of heaven so we're adding to the number of inhabitants that will enter the kingdom of heaven the property that is being built physically that has been purchased and licensed is being built every single day 
Like on First Avenue, a new Multnomah building is being built. Every day the workers go and they add a new brick. They add a window. They add a door. They add a portion of the ceiling. They add the roof. Every day you see evidence of the work being done. The property that we're building in the kingdom is heaven. And that property, every single day that we preach salvation, and a person receives the Holy Spirit, like a brick going into a building, we're adding souls to the kingdom. So we're building God's property in heaven with souls. Not with building material, but with those who are born again, with those who are saved. So the same way your workers are building your buildings until it is completed, so we help Jesus by helping him build the kingdom with the soul of the saved, with those who believe. We can't add, Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. He didn't ask Peter, James, and John to come up with him. He says, no, it's him and his angels that are going to build that place. We can help him down here by sharing the gospel, by sharing the gospel of salvation. And you will be the inhabitants of the place that he went to build. You will be the inhabitants who will occupy that place. When a man constructs a building, someone has to come in afterwards, like that building over there, to rent the space. Whoever has the money to rent a space over there, they will rent that space and use it for work. We, those people are called tenants. Yeah. We, the church who does this work in helping Christ share his message. When you receive salvation, you are the tenants of heaven. You are the citizens who come in. You are the one who adds to the kingdom. When you believe, when you receive the gift of salvation through the Holy Spirit. To construct a building, you need money. Money set aside to accomplish the work, to pay the workers, to buy material, to make sure that old ordinances and licenses have been paid for. You know how much it costs to rent, but you have no idea how much it costs to build. It is millions and millions of dollars. Ask our president, Donald Trump, how many millions and billions does it cost him to own 30, if not 40, hotels worldwide? It costs a lot of money to construct, to keep workers, to do the work that he does outside of the presidency. Unfortunately, to my, to my demise, doing the work of this ministry, doing this work of this ministry, I haven't been able to gross anything. I'm gonna have to cut this uh, sermon short as a result of the time that I have on the computer. So in constructing, and comparing the constructing building to the church building, there's also time, purpose, and training that goes with it. A third point that I have, and this is to answer the question, a worthy, wa uh, worthy wages, right? We've seen Jesus' bold statement a worthy comparison, worthy wages. How should each worker be paid for the work of helping Jesus build his church? We see that in 2 Timothy, it says the worker is worthy of his wages. And this is what I found on the internet to be a worthy wage for a preacher preaching the gospel and helping Jesus day after day, year after year, and doing his work of the ministry. Praise the Lord. And Hallelujah. And the last point was the unworthy master builder. Why no wages? And the, the unworthy master builder is the Christ who was crucified. This is what the Father had sent him to do. What was his wage? 
right? How much did we pay Jesus for all the works that he has done? The work of salvation. We pay him by crucifying him. We pay him by spitting in his face. We pay him by denying him the right to be called Lord and God. That's the end of my message. You know, whoever has the Holy Spirit, in conclusion, I said earlier today on the bus,